January 19th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Genesis 34 and 35 from the Old Testament. Now Dinah, Leah's daughter whom she bore to Jacob, went to meet the young women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamar the Hivite, who ruled that area, saw her, he grabbed her, forced himself on her, and sexually assaulted her. Then he became very attached to Dinah, Jacob's daughter. He fell in love with the young woman and spoke romantically to her. Shechem said to his father, Hamar, Acquire this young girl as my wife. When Jacob heard that Shechem had violated his daughter Dinah, his sons were with the livestock in the field. So Jacob remained silent until they came in. Then Shechem's father, Hamar, went to speak with Jacob about Dinah. Now Jacob's sons had come in from the field when they heard the news. They were offended and very angry because Shechem had disgraced Israel by sexually assaulting Jacob's daughter, a crime that should not be committed. But Hamar made this appeal to them. My son Shechem is in love with your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Let us marry your daughters and take our daughters as wives for yourselves. You may live among us, and the land will be open to you. Live in it, travel freely in it, and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brothers, Let me find favor in your sight, and whatever you require of me I'll give. You can make the bride's price and the gift I must bring very expensive, and I'll give whatever you ask of me. Just give me the young woman as my wife. Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamar deceitfully when they spoke because Shechem had violated their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot give our sister to a man who is not circumcised, for it would be a disgrace to us. We will give you our consent on this one condition. You must become like us by circumcising all your males. Then we will give you our daughter to marry. And we will take your daughters as wives for ourselves. And we will live among you and become one people. But if you do not agree to our terms by being circumcised, then we will take our sister and depart. Their offer pleased Hamar and his son Shechem. The young man did not delay in doing what they asked because he wanted Jacob's daughter Dinah badly. Now he was more important than anyone in his father's household. So Hamar and his son Shechem went to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city. These men are at peace with us, so let them live in the land and travel freely in it, for the land is wide enough for them. We will take their daughters for wives, and we will give them our daughters to marry. Only on this one condition will these men consent to live with us and become one people. They demand that every male among us be circumcised just as they are circumcised. If we do so, won't their livestock, their property, and all their animals become ours? So let's consent to their demand so they will live among us. All the men who assembled at the city gate agreed with Hamar and his son Shechem. Every male who assembled at the city's gate was circumcised. In three days, when they were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and went to the unsuspecting city and slaughtered every male. They killed Hamar and his son Shechem with the sword, took Dinah from Shechem's house, and left. Jacob's sons killed them and looted the city because their sister had been violated. They took their flocks, herds, and donkeys, as well as everything in the city and in the surrounding fields. They captured as plunder all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, including everything in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought ruin on me by making me a foul order among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. I am few in number. They will join forces against me and attack me and both I and my family will be destroyed. But Simeon and Levi replied, Should he treat our sister like a common prostitute? Then God said to Jacob, Go up at once to Bethel and live there. 
Make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob told his household and all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. Let us go up at once to Bethel. Then I will make an altar there to God, who responded to me in my time of distress and has been with me wherever I went. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods that were in their possessions and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob buried them under the oak near Shechem, and they started on their journey. The surrounding cities were afraid of God, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Jacob and all those who were with him arrived at Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. He built an altar there and named the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. Thus it was named Oak of Weeping. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Paden Aram and blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but your name will no longer be called Jacob. Israel will be your name. So God named him Israel. Then God said to him, I am the sovereign God. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, even a company of nations, will descend from you. Kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you. To your descendants, I will also give this land. Then God went up from the place where he spoke with him. So Jacob set up a sacred stone pillar in the place where God spoke with him. He poured out a drink offering on it, and then he poured oil on it. Jacob named the place where God spoke with him Bethel. They traveled on from Bethel, and when Ephrath was still some distance away, Rachel went into labor, and her labor was hard. When her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you are having another son. With her dying breath, she named him Ben-Onai, but his father named him Benjamin instead. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Jacob set up a marker over her grave. It is the marker of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel traveled on and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. When Israel was living in that land, Reuben had sexual relations with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Jacob had twelve sons. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, as well as Simeon, Levi, Judah, Iskar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob, who were born to him in Paddan Aram. So Jacob came back to his father Isaac in Mamre, to Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abram and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived to be 180 years old. Then Isaac breathed his last and joined his ancestors. He died an old man who had lived a full life. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. God, I don't know what I would do if I was one of Di one of Dinah's brothers. I can I can understand their anger, and, and I've never been in this situation. I can definitely understand their anger, but then to turn around and use something that is for blessing, the circumcision that is a blessing from you, and to use it in a massacre. I don't, I don't even have words for that. Um, yet I know that we do. I know that we do things in your name for the, the wrong reasons all the time. And, and so this one is probably going to stick in my heart for a while. And I'll have to think about it and pray about it and figure out some things about it. So 
we'll probably have to talk about this later on, God, because <laughs> there's a lot there. And I can think of a lot of things that we do in our everyday life that are in your name that really aren't. But I do love how we talked about yesterday about Jacob finding his faith in you, finding that path. And, and we all know that once we find that path, it unfortunately doesn't mean that we stay completely on that path. Sometimes we veer off a little, sometimes we veer off a lot, but we do know when we've found that path and, and it's pretty awesome. And so he sends them back to Bethel where that original single stone altar is. Uh, to build a full altar uh, and to protect him from what his two sons have done to the city where they were at. But more importantly, in this passage, you provide him a blessing and approval of, of his faith in you. You've acknowledged that you know that he has faith in you, that he believes in the relationship, that he is working on that relationship. By carrying over that covenant that you gave to Isaac and Abraham. You tell Jacob that you're the sovereign God. To be fruitful and multiply a nation. Even a company of nations will descend from you. Kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to your father and grandfather I will give to you. To your descendants I will also give this land. Now God's not going to do that. If Jacob doesn't have that faith, if God, if he doesn't have that relationship with God. And so God, I just love how the ending of this story comes about uh, in full circle from the Jacob we saw with no faith, only the faith from his family, which is where many of us start all the way to you actually passing on your covenant with him, passing on your blessing to him. And I have to be very thankful today when you show me those blessings to let me know when I'm on the right track. And I also have to be thankful today when you don't show me those blessings and I know I'm on the wrong track. You know, I always watch for fruit in my life. And we'll talk about fruit later on, but I always watch for fruit in my life uh, for good godly things to come out of my life. And when I see those, it's just like what you said to Jacob. Good. You are doing good. You are on the right track. There's nothing else you need from me. You're on the right track. And then when I don't see that fruit, I re-examine what my life looks like. Am I really doing this for you, God? And that's where the fruit is coming from? Or am I really doing this for me? in your name, <laughs> like Simeon and Levi, in your name, I think I'm doing all the right things, but obviously where my heart is set is not right. I think I'm doing things for all the right reasons and I'm not. So, so as I go through today, God, will you help make me very, very aware of those things? The things that I'm doing that are right in your sight, let me be assured of those. But also, please let me know the things I'm doing in your name that aren't what you want me to be doing. Please be really clear about those as well. Please allow my heart and my head and <laughs> my actions to follow through with what it is that you're showing me. I guess that is part of the whole circle back to Simeon and Levi is we do do a lot of things in your name, God, and and yet they're for all the wrong heart reasons. They're not your will. They're not your timing. They're not how you want us to do things. And even we may be doing them for other reasons, such as our ego. So today, let me be very aware of those, aware of the good in your name and aware of the bad things I'm <laughs> doing in your name and help me to stop those things. Thank you, God. In your son's name we pray. Amen.